Hey, here we, here we yeah. go. Calling Chris Anderson in London. Chris Anderson is, believe it or not, in London. And uh, calling require in Chicago. I am here in Chicago. Um, as usual. Um, yes, as usual. Welcome, everybody, to History Happy Hour, brought to you by uh, Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours, which have a great variety of history tours in Europe, the U.S., the Pacific, and you can check them out at Stephen Ambrose Tours. Dot com and whether you're watching live or watching on replay or listening on the HHH podcast thank you for joining us we'll be talking today about western outlaw billy the kid not an obscure yes. topic chris but maybe one that people don't know as much as they think they do it's, the live is new to me yeah so uh do let us know uh wh who's here and where where you're from and what you're drinking it is history happy hour after all uh, but we welcome you all to join the show. And Chris, I think we really want to get right to the interview today. So give us a, a cue here and we'll get started. Bing. The bar is open. The bar is open, and this summer we interviewed a gentleman named Mark Lee Gardner about his book, The Earth is All That Lasts, which is about Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull. And we were talking to him after the show, as is our want, and he said, you know, you guys should interview this young guy from Australia who's just written a nice. really big book about Billy the Kid and has unearthed all sorts of cool stuff. So it is today that we are happy to Following welcome. up on that suggestion. Yeah, we, we listen. We have, we have like listening it. skills. And so we are going to be talking today to James B. Mills, the author of Billy the Kid, El Bendito Simpatico. And James is joining us from New South Wales, Australia. Did I say that all correctly? You said that correctly. All right. So um, don't get too excited, James. Okay. <laughs> just, just, just keep, keep calm. Well, it's one I am here, man. <laughs> We have, we have a lot of time zone dysphoria as we are yes. setting this interview up. Um, James, you've been interested in the uh, American frontier since childhood. Given that Australia has its own frontier, what made you want to immerse yourself and write about the American West? Well, I think the biggest part of that was watching uh, the old Westerns with my mother as a kid. Uh, every Sunday they had um, all the old classic black and white westerns on and we used to like, lie on the, on the couch we call it a lounge you guys call it a couch every sunday and watch them and i was just drawn to it and uh i mean i was checking out books from the library about native americans and cowboy history when i was seven eight years old other kids in my class were reading goosebumps books and i was reading about sitting bull um bit of an eccentric kid i i, I asked for an electric typewriter for my ninth birthday because i just loved writing so and all my family thought i was weird um you know, what did they know i was assigned to things to come oh join the club man yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so so james uh really the kid is obviously a figure that looms pretty large and i would say popular culture maybe not history um and as you did the research on this book how much of what we know about Billy the Kid is is popular mythology, and how much is it is fact, and and where does the truth lie? I mean, where you know, that's a big question. Uh, in terms of how much do people really know, <laughs> that's impossible to estimate because he is one of the most mythologized historical figures. Not just in frontier history, but probably in American history. Um, there have been so many uh, misconceptions, uh, demonizations, whatever you want to call them, romanticism, just all manner of. But, and and I mean, I spent over 20 years researching him, looking into it, and with relentless passion. Right. And the most fascinating thing I found was that the. The real history was just far more interesting than any kind of mythology or any film. All the films that have been made about him, some of them are really good and entertaining, but 
the real story is much more interesting. And, you know, I, I say it often, you know, I actually don't have much interest in Billy the Kid. He's mostly right. myth. Henry McCarty, alias William H. Bonnie, is a lot more interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, Rick, I'm going to steal, I want to steal a march from you. Go ahead. Uh, but so picking up on Henry McCarty then, just for the few folks that probably have no, you know, the very, very few folks who only have the vaguest idea of who he is, just maybe some five or six bullet points so we have a baseline. Who was this guy? Where did he come from? And, and sort of what got the ball rolling with his fame, just so we know where we're, where we're starting the conversation. Well, he was an Irish boy. We'll start there. Um, he was, in all probability, born in New York in around 18, 1860, 1859, 1860. Uh, supposedly, it appears his father died when he was four. His family moved west. They went through Indiana. They really arrived on the frontier in around 1869, 1870, when they arrived in Wichita, Kansas. And that would have been a culture shock. And they ended up moving further west through Colorado and finally arrived into Mexico territory, of course. And then when he was about, his mother remarried. And when he was about 13 or 14, his mother died of tuberculosis. And his stepfather, I wouldn't say he was a bad guy necessarily, but he was kind of indifferent to them. He, you know, was focused on wanting to go mining and make his fortune. And so basically from the age of, 14 or so, he, he had to look after himself. On the southwestern frontier, extremely violent place. Uh, the Apaches were still on the war path. I mean, it was incredible. And he drifted and eventually fell in with a, a horse thief who taught him the art of horse thievery. And, uh, well, that kind of led to him rolling along and getting in, getting, he eventually got employed he shot a man in self-defense in Arizona, and then he eventually went back to New Mexico and got employed by an Englishman named John Henry Tunstall as a ranch hand. And then Tunstall was murdered about three months later by his uh, opposition, I guess, in Lincoln County. And that sparked the Lincoln County War, and it was just guerrilla warfare, anarchy across Lincoln County for months and months and months. And then eventually Billy tried to get a pardon, from the governor, Lou Wallace, uh, who didn't deliver on it, even though he promised it to him. And so eventually he went back to cattle rustling. What else was he going to do, I guess, and gambling. And his name was really made in the – he only really became famous about, about six months before he was killed. Uh, it was the press that made him a superstar. A uh, journalist named J.H. Kubler for the Las Vegas Gazette gave him the, the nickname Billy the Kid, which just is – Perfect. It's the perfect name for an outlaw. Right. And of course, Pat Garrett, the cattleman, John Chisholm, the Santa Fe Ring, they wanted to get rid of the kid because he was, it wasn't that he was rustling cattle, it was who he was rustling them from. If he'd been stealing from impoverished Mexicans, nobody would have cared. But he was stealing from the wealthy cattlemen, and that's what brought the heat down. So, of course, Pat Garrett went after him and I think most people know the story. Captured him, Billy famously escaped, and then got killed by Pat Garrett in uh, Fort Sumner on at twelve thirty in the morning of July fifteenth, eighteen eighty one. You know, one of the and, things that um, your your book is is subtitled uh, "El Bendito Simpatico." I've said it correctly twice. I'm not going to try to say it again. Um, uh, which, of course, suggests that he was likable, but it also uh, suggests that there's a strong connection with the Hispanic community in New Mexico. And that really is one of the things that I think certainly has never been part of the, the popular culture picture of Billy the Kid. Uh, the, and you, you really devote a lot of time to this and a strong connection. Can you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. Um I came up with the title, it, it is appropriate because he was a bandido and yet 95% of the recollections from the people who actually knew him personally are positive. He was a very likable kid, whether some people can accept that or not. Uh, he was a thief and he killed his share of men on the southwestern frontier, but he was very, very popular, very well liked. Um, with the Hispanos of Nuevo Mexico, his relationship with them was 
quite extraordinary. He, I mean, he spoke fluent uh, Spanish. He must have picked. He would have picked that up in his younger years. And it was just a. They embraced him as a friend. He, he was. Oh, how could I explain it? Really, in short terms, he just connected with them very easily. He spoke their language. He enjoyed their culture. He, he adapted it to himself. He preferred their company. One of his uh, many amigos, Paco and Naya, once said straight up, he said, Billy preferred to be with Hispanics than with Americans. Uh, and he did. He preferred their company. He preferred to, to be around them. And they embraced him as a folk hero because from their perspective, Billy was fighting against the corrupt gringos who were running things in their territory and damaging a lot of Hispanic lives. So they viewed him as a hero. Um, the Anglo press portrayed him as being the worst outlaw you can imagine. But as far as the Hispanos were concerned, Billy was their guy. They loved him. And they, many of them, decades later, went to their graves, still defending his legacy and defending him personally, who, who he was. Um, there was one little one uh, young man in Lincoln who was only about six or seven years old when he knew Billy. Billy used to come and visit his father in Lincoln, who was a lawyer. And uh, he, he later said, he said, oh, Billy was an outlaw, but he never was bad. That was the, that's the kind of quote you can expect from a lot of the Hispano contemporaries. They, they really loved him. So is it, kind of a, is it kind of an affiliation with the dispossessed? I mean, he's sort of, um, he, you know, he's, he's an, he's an outlaw in that sense that he's, He's he's aligned against the the powerful interests, so it would be kind of natural to be uh, aligned with those people who who don't have very much. Yeah, and that's uh, I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't necessarily to the Hispanos. He was like a Robin Hood or a Don Quixote, but it's uh, I I don't think that was ever a conscious decision that he made. I don't think Billy ever thought, you know, I'm going to be these people's champion. Uh, he was just uh, very open and affable with them. He was honest with them. He used to steal from a, uh, a lot of uh, Anglo cattlemen and ranchers. He'd steal horses and cattle, but there's no record of him ever stealing from his barn. Um, and, I mean, if he did, uh, there's no record of it, And uh, which would have been counterproductive if he had because their support for him would have dissipated very quickly if he had started doing that. They used to hide him when he was being pursued. That um, uh, uh, Champion of the dispossessed. He was a champion of the Hispanos of, of Nuevo Mexico, but he was no saint either. Um, he wasn't... Uh, I, don't, I don't deal with, you know, kind of heroes and villains. I, I write about people, and, and I think uh, especially people from frontier history are far too complex to be pigeonholed as either hero or villain. And, and I'm that, I mean that about Wyatt Earp, anyone, uh, Doc Holliday, Geronimo, whoever you want. And uh, Billy, yeah, he did He did become like a symbol of resistance against predatory capitalism and uh, Anglo expansion in the territory. But whether or not it was intentional, he wasn't Emiliano Zapata. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, he was, and he was at the end of the day. I mean, he was about 2021 20, when he was killed. This was a young, I mean, he was a teenager most of his exploits. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't say he was a revolutionary, I'll put it that way, but he, <laughs> was, he, he was a uh, he, he was a champion of the US monarchs. Yeah. So, James, one of the things that uh, I, I find interesting, um, what, and I'll be, what little I know about the story is, is that how there were certain things that happened to him um, that aren't necessarily something that he does or he gets he's involved in a situation and he's end up dealing with this chain reactions of things that takes his life at all sorts of i guess unexpected or unwelcome directions um and i i kind of picked up on that and some things i read in the book and some interviews that i i listened to uh, that you had done and i wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you know unintended consequences took in places that Maybe he didn't expect because again, like as you say, this is just a teenager, right? And he's in an odd sort of situation. Well, they, well, they didn't call him a kid for nothing. Um, that's what he was basically. 
Uh, there's numerous occasions. I mean, he when he rode into Lincoln County, I mean, he, he had no part in, in all the stuff that built up to the outbreak of the Lincoln County War between Jimmy Dolan and the House and McQueen and Tunstall. He had no part in that. Uh, he just got there, basically, and he just happened to end up working for the guy who was murdered. And that's what kicked off the war. Um, another aspect of thing, I mean, the Santa Fe Ring were constantly, they had their hand in everything in the, in the territory. It was quite remarkable. So a lot of things were, you know, transpiring around him that were beyond his control. Um, he tried very, very hard to get a pardon from Governor Lou Wallace, and he spent four months in voluntary confinement in Lincoln. Uh, he agreed to testify against uh, Jimmy Dolan and a couple other, couple other outlaws who had been involved in Tunstall's murder, and he did get his word. Um, he waited months, but the pardon never came. So in the end, he... Because the truth of it was, Governor Lou Wallace didn't give a rat's ass about Billy Bonney. He, did, he didn't even... He, he hated Lincoln County. He hated New Mexico. He never wanted the job. Um, he wanted to be an ambassador. He did not want to be the governor of New Mexico. And Lou Wallace, of course, he wrote Ben Hur. Yeah. And uh, Lou, Lou Wallace did some things in his life to be very proud of. Uh, his tenure as New Mexico governor really wasn't one of them. He did a half ass job. <laughs> and uh, he didn't want the position. He'd barely, he'd barely been there for two months and he was requesting to get out of there. And so, I mean, that's something that went beyond his control. And he had no control over what the press wrote about. I mean, yeah, he was a rustler. He was stealing horses and cattle, and he'd shot a few men here and there over the years, but he couldn't control what the press were writing about him, making him sound like this demonic Superman. I mean, they had him shooting people that didn't exist and doing all sorts of things and all these crazy stories. So his life was often determined by a combination of poor choices, which I guess you can expect from a teenager, not that that was right, and also circumstances that were beyond his control. It was just, it's, it almost seems like fate at times, the way his life transpired. Yeah. yeah. Why, why does he, why does the press sort of, or a particular person or newspaper, why do they pick him? What, what he's, he's, as you say, he's a kid, he's a teenager. Uh, uh, he's not a bigger than life uh, supervillain who's you know crisscrossing states and robbing banks. Uh, uh, why is he suddenly subject to this treatment that sort of elevates him to in his own lifetime to this to this sort of legendary mythic status, which you know probably doesn't help his cause getting a pardon or uh, or uh, or leading an unobtrusive life. Well. I don't know. Uh, he did try very hard to get a pardon, but then yeah, they, when that didn't come through, he went back to rustling. So I don't know how that would have turned out. We'll never know. Um, why him? I think the name had a lot to do with it. Billy the Kid was just a really catchy name. And it was just one of those phenomenons that caught on. It just it spread so quickly. It was It was insane. He was known regionally. People knew who he was. Because well, some people knew who he was because he fought in the Lincoln County War, and his name had been in the papers then. And um, but then, sold a lot of other, sold a lot of other guys. Um, why he became so huge? It was just happenstance. It really was. I, <laughs> it started with uh, one article that gave him the name, and then it just they picked up on it, and it just spread like wildfire, and it made for a crazy story. And, of course, then only a few weeks later, Pat Garrett caught him and he was transported to uh, Las Vegas where he was interviewed and Billy was very witty, charming. And, uh, yeah, they just they had a superstar on their hands, even though that wasn't what he ever intended. And judging by what he said about it himself, he never really cared for that fame. He, he, didn't, he said himself, he said, I'm getting up a terrible reputation. That's how he felt about it. Um, he didn't particularly like it at all. He certainly didn't like a lot of the the big, wild, fanciful stories that were being told about him. It made him sound like a cross between Adolf Hitler and Charles Manson, um, or something, something like that. I mean, it was just crazy. But um, he did enough to earn his fame in the end. But what really, what really launched him? I mean, he, when his death was in the national news, when it happened, there were reports of his death in Canada in. England. 
Right. But I think he probably would have probably faded uh, if it weren't for a lot of the sensationalist writers who expounded on his story with even more mythology and craziness in the years following his death, in particular Walter Noble Burns, who was a very good writer. He was no historian at all, um, but he was a good writer. Uh, his book, uh, The Saga of Billy the Kid, published in 1926, that's the book that really made Billy the Kid and ensured his everlasting fame. That was the first book they made a film you know, adaption of, even though it's, more, it's far more literature than history. Um, it's just, I mean, it's just one of those things why some people just become famous thanks to the press, and he was one of them. Yeah. So, but he, but he was aware of this as it's happening to him at oh, the yeah. time. Yeah, he he wrote a letter to the governor, kind of. Billy, Billy had a tendency to stretch the truth sometimes. I mean, he did tell yeah. one reporter that he never rustled any cattle, which was <laughs> bullshit. Um, <laughs> but you know, uh, he, he was aware of it, and uh, I mean, there was no way for him not to be aware of it when, after Pat Garrett captured him. And but I think what really sealed, and I forgot to mention this before, I think what really sealed his fame uh, prior to the the mythological books and everything was the jailbreak, which was the undoubtedly. Billy was a flesh and blood person, but that jailbreak was something else. That was the most spectacular jailbreak in all of American frontier history. Nobody ever escaped jail like that before or since. So and, well, uh, well, tell us, tell, tell us tell about, us about, about that, jail, that jailbreak. The jailbreak? Yeah. That was April, that was April 28, uh, 1881. It was a warm afternoon and a uh, warm evening, and Billy Bonnie was being guarded. Pat Garrett was out of town. He rode over to uh, White Oaks on business and Billy Bonney had been left alone with Bob Ollinger, who was, even Pat Garrett said later, he was afraid to sleep around. Uh, that yeah. tells you what kind of guy he was. Uh, very malicious psychopath. Uh, had no business being a lawman. I think even Pat Garrett knew that. And a guy named James W. Bell, who we don't really know much about, other than that he was apparently tall and had a big knife scar right down his face. And he was a miner in White Oaks at one point. And uh, Bob Ollinger, around 6 o'clock, took uh, five other prisoners who were being kept in a separate room. Uh, there you go. Yeah, he took them across the street and uh, to the Wart Wortley Hotel for supper. And Billy asked James W. Bell to take him out back to the privy. They came back inside, and as they were headed up the stairs, Billy noticed that Bell had let his guard down, which Pat Garrett had warned him not to do. Uh, and he swung around and walloped Bell a couple of times over the head, uh, managed to get a hold of Bell's gun, which had spilled out of its holster onto the floor, and he told Bell to throw up his hands. Uh, he didn't want to kill Bell. He told uh, some people that later. He never intended to kill Bell. But James W. Bell instinctively but fatally turned and ran, and Billy squeezed the trigger and shot Bell through his side. Um, <laughs> and Bell died. Bell died out the back. Of course, Bob Ollinger heard the shot, and by the time he reached the courthouse, Billy was up in the window waiting for him with his own shotgun and below Bob, boom. And it, to just wham, bam, both his guards dead. And then he spent an hour or so hanging around. He actually stood out on the balcony and justified his actions to the townsfolk. He didn't want people to think <laughs> of I mean, what, what kind of outlaw even thinks to do that, let alone does it? He's in the middle of a jailbreak. And he goes out onto the balcony and tells, you know, hey, I didn't want to shoot Bell, but he ran. I had no choice. I'm doing what I have to do. I'm, what were his words? I'm standing pat against the world. That's how he described it. And uh, then he rode out of town singing. Without a well, he rode out, at, uh, rode west out of Lincoln singing. And it, it just happened so quickly. And it was just, I mean, I've only described the basics of it, but the way right. he pulled that off was just unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. I want to remind everybody that we are talking today to James B. Mills, who's the author of a new book, Billy the Kid, El Bendito Simpatico, uh, and he's joining us from Australia here on History Happy Hour. One of the things, James, about your book is you you are really dive deep into the research. Um, 
And uh, you're very careful to delineate where the information comes from, to kind of paint a picture of the context, of the time, of the other characters, to offer a lot of backstory. And I wondered, I mean, I have a couple of questions regarding this, but one is, I wonder, um, you know, if you chose to do that because this is a topic where there's just a whole lot of people convinced of all sorts of things that aren't absolutely true. And the other question is, you know, what kinds of things did you find that it appeared that like nobody else had found before you or really paid attention to before you? Well, what was the first question again? It's my fault. <laughs> I know, the danger yeah, he does of that. asking two that. questions. Yeah, uh, the, the I, I remember now. I thought, yeah. It was, uh, did I feel the need to include heavy notations because a lot of people... Not so much the notations, them. but just the very careful way that you, you, you really dive into the story and have, you know, very, like, like when you're talking about where he's born and, you know, maybe it was here, we don't know for sure. And you have a lot of, a lot of information and when you're talking about the Lincoln County War, you're really talking about all the different people involved in this and, and a lot of detail about it. Well, I mean, all of that affected the course of Billy's life um, as... Chris touched on earlier, you know, sometimes it was a chain reaction of events. There was a lot to detail. Um, if you're going to write a book about Billy Pawnee, first thing you need to do is grow some alligator skin. Um, you need to be prepared to be attacked by a pack of wolves when it comes out because yep. you're going to have people picking it apart. Um, and that's fine. They, they want to try that, they can try it. Um, I'm sure there's a couple of things I got wrong in there somewhere. No, the only people who expect perfection from any history book are those who have never written one. But um, it was important, I think, to cover the broad story because I didn't want... I think if you only cover Billy's activities ex almost exclusively, he becomes an anomaly when really... When it came to stealing horses and cattle and shooting a few men, he was one of a thousand. I mean, that really was the times... I, that doesn't make it right. I'm not saying that, oh, well, it's okay for Billy to do it for everyone. No, that's not what I'm saying at all. But I didn't want him to become, he, he was really nothing special in that regard. Um, and there was just so much that went on that directed the, the course of his life and how things turned out. And there's so many colourful characters. I mean, you, you couldn't make up a guy like Jimmy Dolan. I mean, he's he was flesh and blood and I write of him that way. But, I mean, he's, <laughs> you know, he, he would make a half-decent Marvel villain, I think, almost. Um, uh, but... At the same time, I mean, he had his good points too. He wasn't Satan, um, if you believe in Satan. But, uh, and in the second question that you asked was, what did I discover that, well, a couple of years ago, I came across an interview with Billy himself that uh, as far as I knew and as all the people I've spoken to, nobody had seen before. Um, so that was a big shocker. That was before I even started writing. The book. Um, a number of things I found primarily related to his relationship with the Espanos, I think the thing that knocked me over the most was that, and nobody had ever really, nobody, I didn't get any written about it, was that while he was being held in jail before he made his break, uh, there were a bunch of Hispanos in San Patricio and Picasso, which were near Lincoln. They were actually planning to bust him out. They were putting together a posse of roughly, of supposedly 20 heavily armed men they were going to ride into Lincoln and bust Billy out. They were not going to sit back and let him hang. And that, again, is a testament to how much they loved him, their affection for him. And that's something that I think is very important and yet was never touched upon before in any previous Billy book. And I, I found that strange. And that, to me, just it, it broadens who he was as a person and how much he meant to those people. And I, I feel that Billy... I wanted to write about him as a flesh and blood human being, free of all mythos and horseshit and all of that. And I, I feel the only way to achieve that was you have to give the Hispano recollections and perspective of him equal consideration to the Anglo perspective, which has not always been the case. I'm not accusing previous biographers or authors of being racist or anything like that, but the Hispano side of his history did seem to be kind of kept aside and I wanted to really dive into it and bring it bring it out and I think it's appropriate because he was ultimately he was as much Billy 
as he was Billy, which is a lot of, a lot of the Hispanos call him. He was Billito. And uh, he belongs to them more than anyone, I think. Chris, can I follow up on that? Uh, yes, you may. Yes, yeah. So, so there's a story in the book of of a, of a confrontation uh, between, and it kind of, kind of brings this out what we're talking about with this research between uh, 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 Billy and uh, and a cattleman, uh, John Chisholm, and um, yeah. and uh, you know, so there's there's a very detailed account of it uh, from one person who was there, but there are other accounts of it. Uh, from people who weren't there, and you're, and you know, and I, I did actually dive in and read a, a very long footnote about this, and you're in the back of your book, but that uh, that uh, that that a lot of people have taken the accounts of the people who weren't there over the uh, account of the person who was there, who I, I believe was uh, Hispanic. So, can you talk a little bit about that and about choices that you had to make to try to to get to the bottom of the story and avoid the the misinformation that other people had kind of planted along the way? Well, I actually debated this with uh, your old friend, Mark Lee Gardner, a couple of months ago. Mark and I, are, we're friends, um, but we often challenge each other on a lot of things. And we were going back and forth on this in regards to those accounts of that incident, as well as the Joe Grant uh, self-defense shooting. Um, the fact is the vast, vast majority of previous biographers, historians, if not all of them pretty much, went with the two Anglo accounts of that confrontation from people who weren't there, um, people who were going on hearsay. Um, now, the Hispano account, like the two Anglo ones, was provided many decades later. But the fact is the Hispano account, at the very least, uh, the, the guy, Apolicapio Paco and Nate, um, if you want to be cynical and say, oh, maybe he wasn't really in the saloon when it happened, I, okay, you can feel that way. I personally feel there's no reason to not believe that he wasn't there. He, at the very least, he was living in the Fort Sumner area at the time. The two Anglo accounts from two Anglo people, uh, Lily Klasner and Will Chisholm, neither of them were living anywhere near Fort Sumner when that confrontation happened. And they were both relying on hearsay, what they heard from other people. Paco and Naya described what he recalled witnessing with his own eyes. To me, that's a no-brainer, which source you're going to put more stock in. A lot of previous historians didn't. I feel... Well, I'm sorry, but Parker is the one I've got to go with there. I mean, he, yeah. I, I think that's, that's a, and yet that kind of thing has happened with, with some of Billy's history. That there has been, I, I don't even think it was intentional. Um, and as Mark, Mark Lee Gardner and I spoke about it, Parker, I know, did get, uh, in his recollections, he did get some things wrong. He was bad with dates and time frames, which is to be expected how old he was at the time. But at the end of the day, he was there. And uh, the other two Anglo people at provided second-hand hearsay of what happened in that confrontation, they weren't. So he's the well, one to go with. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I thought about that uh, as I was reading the book about this topic of oral history and accounts. Oh, and can I, sorry. oh no, go ahead. I don't please. mean to interrupt. No, I don't no, mean to interrupt. I just, one point I wanted to add was, and Paco and Nay's account sounds far more realistic and far more mm -hmm. believable for those times. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, no. Just again, picking up on that, you know, uh, in an earlier show, we had um, an, an author talk about his book about the Alamo, and he was talking about how a lot of the new research on the Alamo, for years, they said, well, nobody survived, so nobody knows what happened. Well, there were Hispanics that were there, left accounts, and yeah, yeah. and so this is sort of a similar scenario. And as I'm reading that book, and I'm reading your book, I'm like. Is there like are we missing half of Western history here, and and are we gonna ever get around to kind of reading the other half? I mean, are there these sources that we're not tapping into? Uh, yeah, probably yeah. a lot. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, I'm working. I'm working on a new book now. Um, it's called In the Days of Billy the Kid: The Frontier Lives of Jose Chavez, Chavez, Juan Patron, Martin Chavez, and Nuno Salazar. And this is a book that will span, these guys all knew Billy, they were friends with him. Uh, three of them fought alongside him in the Lincoln County War. But it's about their lives and it's centred around their lives and it will stretch from the 1850s all the way to the 1930s. And I'm trying my best with that to try and even that out and bring the Hispanic side of, the, of that history forward. But yeah, you're right. I think a lot of a lot of history in that sense, I mean, it, people said for so long, oh, nobody survived the Alamo. What? <laughs> There was a lot of survivors. There was an entire army that survived. Right. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, I, I'm sorry, but they, they kicked the Texans' ass and they lived. That's how it goes. I mean, however you want to feel about Alamo, it's none of my business in that sense. But it, it um, to me, okay, to me, uh, not giving the Hispanic side of Billy's history and, and New Mexico, New Mexico, it's called New Mexico, Nuevo Mexico history, that, that's kind of like writing a book about Sitting Bull and not really giving credence much time to the Native American accounts right. and just sticking to the white perspective. But wait a minute. And the Hispanos, in Billy's case, they were the people he spent the most time with. They knew him better than anyone. Right. And yet it always seemed to be more favoured towards the Anglo side of things. And uh, to answer your question, yeah, probably. To some degree anyway, I think that... Um, I mean, uh, there might be some people who would dismiss what the Hispanics said about the Alamo, but they were there. It matters. But this this is part and parcel with a with a broader thing, which really isn't just about the West. But I mean, you know, the um, I don't know within the last ten years, you know, reading that that some huge percentage of cowboys were uh, African American. Uh, you yep. know, n- somehow they missed that on Gunsmoke. I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, or. Or uh, the big, I don't I can't remember the names of all the old Westerns. James probably remembers the names of them better than I do. Uh, you know, in other areas where, you know, it turns out that the history gets told is, is very one-sided because that's just kind of what's always been done. And it's this revelation to discover that there there are other perspectives. And, and I mean, we just talked uh, a couple of weeks ago to... Uh, an author who was talking about the Hessians in um, the Revolutionary War, and I know we're far afield from Billy the Kid here, but the the idea, the very idea that one-third of the British troops, uh, regular troops in the Revolution, were actually German uh, soldiers, uh, uh, you know, imported to help fight that battle, and telling the story from their point of view. And suddenly, you know, it's like, it's like, it wasn't just like, oh, the evil Hessians, you know, hitting people with their bayonets, spearing them with their bayonets. It was what they were writing home to their families and what they saw in America and everything. And I think that doing that, doing what you're doing, doing what she's doing, I mean, it, it's really refreshing. I mean, it gives you a, um, you know, kind of a broader way of, of understanding and it kind of opens you up a little bit. It definitely does. In regards to black cowboys, I'll, I'll tell you, um, our, our friend of mine, historian friend of mine in the field, who's a black historian, a uh, great, great guy, uh, R.T. Burton. Uh, he wrote a biography uh, of uh, Bass Reeves, mm-hmm. who was a black, yeah, and he was by far the most badass lawman that ever existed. He makes White Earp look like a, like a, <laughs> he really does. Um, nothing again. I mean, White Earp, Pat Garrett, they look like pansies compared to him. He was, oh, um, I think, uh, as it pertains like, to, like, for example, the Lincoln County War, there's historians who tend to take sides in that. I really don't. I, I have no dog in that fight. Um, if I have a loyalty to anyone in the Lincoln County War, uh, it would probably be to the regulators and the working class ranchers from Seven Rivers who are actually doing the fighting in the trenches. Um, can you can you actually can you actually tell us a little bit? We we've touched on the Lincoln County War uh, a few times, but for people who don't know much about that, and it's such a big part of the story, can you kind of give us a, a capsule of that? What that is? Well, you had a group of Irish businessmen who were they were it in Lincoln County. They were the big dogs, and then a Scottish attorney arrived named Alexander McSween, uh, closely followed by a very ambitious and greedy. A uh, young Englishman named John Henry Tunstall, and they kind of paired up. But the real source of all the animosity and hatred that sparked that war was over a life insurance policy. Uh, the Irishman guys had hired Alexander McSween, and they firmly believed that the money, we still don't know what happened to the funds. Alexander McSween acquired them, we still don't know what happened to them. They firmly believed that he had embezzled them. Um, we have no evidence that he embezzled them, but we have no evidence that he didn't either. The money never showed up. So that's what really started. And they were also the house, which was the Irish firm, were heavily, heavily in debt. They were on the verge of bankruptcy. And then this this Englishman, you've got to remember, these guys were Irish Catholics. McSween and Tunstall were Protestant, British Protestant. And this uh, little Englishman shows up and with unlimited supply of funds, it seemed like, a uh, very wealthy family. And uh, he was a threat to their, 
I wouldn't say dominance, but their strengths in terms of uh, mercantile affairs. And um, it all just eventually blew up and uh, McSween ended up getting thrown in jail and getting charged with embezzlement. And then John Tun still got pinned sort of in with that, even though he had nothing to do with the Fritz Insurance Funds case. And uh, in the end, the House decided to, they got rid of John Tunstall. And uh, Billy Bonney had been working for Tunstall for about three months then, and it really kind of opened the door for him. And when Tunstall was killed, he was one very pissed off young man. And uh, he made him pay for it. So did the regulators. And it just broke into all out war. But it, it's, the Lincoln County was a very complex subject. It would take me an hour just to describe all the the real elements to it, but uh, that's the basics. And, and, it's, and, that, and this was a this was a, a war or an event that it was getting pretty wide coverage, right? I mean, people all over the place had heard. Oh about yeah, it. yeah, uh, yeah. Not really. I wouldn't say so. There were kind of there were word of it here and there in the, in some other newspapers, but it was mostly in the southwest. Right. But it was a pretty big deal when it was happening, and it was pretty crazy. And there was shootings back and forth. It was just guerrilla war all over the place. And Billy was in the thick of it with about 100 other guys. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd say probably a rough estimate, about two dozen men ended up getting killed all up, but uh, including Alexander McSwing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that was the frontier times. It's, you pissed someone off back then. <laughs> There's yeah. a chance you might get shot. So, Jeff, Oh, go ahead, Rick. No, no, go. I was just going to say, yeah, same today. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, go ahead, Chris. Well, what, you know, I, I think I know the answer to this, but I'd like to hear it from you. As as the mythology of Billy is is being crafted while he's still alive and, and he's becoming this good or evil folk hero or villain, no matter, depending on how you look at it, is anybody trying to like set the record straight or say, Hey, wait a minute. There's 900 other guys involved in this. Let's say the Lincoln County war. Or he just seems to be the guy. Um, and is anybody, did, else anybody to... did anybody try to stem the tide in terms of saying, Hey, hold on a minute here. He hasn't killed yeah, this many yeah. men. Yeah. Or, or, yeah, or, 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 okay. Ironically, Pat Garrett, the guy who killed him. Yeah. Pat Garrett. Right. Um, he said to a reporter um, just a few days after he shot the kid, and we don't know much of what he said because Pat wasn't always talkative, but the reporter said that Pat Garrett spoke very kindly of Billy Bonney, and the reporter asked him, you know, has he, did he kill as many men as they're saying, you know, 20, 30, 40, and Pat Garrett said no, no. And uh, Pat Garrett himself many years later said in an interview with a newspaper, he said there are a lot of good things about Billy. He said, I've known far worse men than him. Uh, and he even said, and I quote, this is Pat Garrett's words, Billy was not what you would call a killer. He never shot up a town or he never made a gunplay. He didn't mean that kind of thing. So was anyone kind of trying to simmer it down a little? Yeah, Pat Garrett at times, ironically. But at the same time, Pat Garrett also, you know, him and his ghostwriter, Ash Ups, and they put out the first real significant kind of book about Billy uh, the year following his death, which was absolutely full of crap that we now know was just total mythos. And I mean, but I think a lot of that was the work of Ash Upton more than Garrett. So, but ultimately, the legend was just too big and too exciting to for anyone, I think, to really care. His friends cared, the, the people who knew Billy, they cared. Um, uh, one of his pals who rode with him in the Lincoln County War, Frank Coe, wrote a letter to a newspaper many decades later saying enough is enough. I, I feel like I'm letting a friend down by staying silent about this. Um, he wasn't the bloodthirsty monster that they've made him out to be. He never killed anywhere near as many men. That, but by then it was just the legend was too strong. And um, But as the years went by, 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, up until today, a lot of historians started digging more for the truth and it's been a very slow process, but I think, you know, and hopefully my book at least, uh, I'm not claiming to have the last word on Bonnie, that there's never going to be a last word on him, but I I hope, as I wrote in the preface, I hope above all else that, that Billy emerged from my book as human. Not a hero or a villain, just human. Yeah. Just a flesh and blood person. 
Pat Garrett, uh, the sheriff who killed Billy the Kid uh, in 1881, um, what kind of relationship did they have before that? They did know each other, right? Yeah, they knew each other. Um, that depends on who you asked. Some people said they were friends, um, but then we don't know how close friends they were. Were they the best friends, like the, some of the movies have made them out to be? No. No, they certainly they weren't best friends. Um, their personalities were very different. Billy was a lot more outgoing. Uh, he was a good gambler. Um, Pat Garrett was more reserved and a terrible gambler. Um, they kind of, there were, some people believe that, you know, that they did rustle cattle a bit together, which for a number of few reasons may have been possible. Um, they were never bosom buddies, but they certainly knew one another. They both lived in Fort Sumner at, at the same time for a period of, for a while. So they knew each other. They knew each other, I think, maybe a little better than Pat Garrett wanted the world to know. But were they best friends? No. But it's exact just how just how close they were. One of one of Pat Garrett's deputies did say later that, in re, in reference to Garrett, he said, "I know that he he did like the kid, and it bothered him exceedingly to have to kill him." Um. At the same time, Pat felt he was just doing what he had to do, which he was. Um. How close were they? Depends who you ask. I mean. I think I've summed it up as best I can. That's one of those things that I don't think we'll ever get to the bottom of, really. Well, it seems like every story with Billy that there are two, there can be two versions of the events depending on like where you fall and the uh, whose side you're on, sort of thing. A, a lot of them, yeah, and a lot of them you have yeah. to piece together from multiple accounts, which is never easy. But well, that's why I spent right. eighteen months writing that book like a zombie with no sleep. So yeah, well, you know, it's and I wanted to ask you about that, James. So. You you know you set out on this this mission to write a story about Billy the Kid. He's obviously had a lot written about him before. Um, you know, you weren't the first to the rodeo, I guess you'd say. But your account. Oh, I like is, that, Chris. You know, I like that. Yeah, yeah. nice Western like, reference uh, you see in there. Authoritative. Um, so you've clearly uncovered new things. You've presented it in a new way. As you were researching it. Were you surprised that you found what you found about him? Was it, you know, when you set out to do this? Sometimes, yeah. Um, there were a few things there that kind of surprised me. I was like, geez, where did that come from? Um, there were times where it felt kind of surreal. I remember I unco uncovered this previously unknown uh, letter that uh, one of the kid's friends, Henry Hoyt, had sent to another one of the kids, well, acquaintances, Charlie Seringo. And it gave a very vivid account of how Billy once saved a, a young Hispano boy's life outside of Fort Sumner. Uh, the boy had been struck by a smallpox and uh, had been left to die alone in a cabin. And Billy presumably must have known this boy and probably knew the family. And he rode out and he found the boy and he hired a bunch of things to, to drive the boy all the way to Las Vegas in a wagon. Uh, saved his life, basically. Um, that, that's something that when I found that, I was like, whoa, that's very human. Um, but it's, uh, there's so much to, to be found, and I think there's probably still some more to be found. Uh, another thing I found a previously unknown little interview with Sally Pism, which she confirmed a, a story that uh, several years before, in fact, she confirmed, corroborated a story about, Billy and her that uh, and one of the regulators had told. And so that was another little little thing as well. And I was also surprised to find, I, I managed to find the name of uh, Frank Cahill, who was the first man Billy ever shot, I managed to find the names of his parents, which was a nice little touch. And a lot of other things, um, I mean, even Lawrence G. Murphy, who I'm sure people have seen Young Guns, uh, yeah. was played by Jack Blance. And uh, he actually turned out, every, everyone had had his birth year wrong. In fact, by several years, he was quite younger than we thought he was. Um, so there's there's a number of things that surprised me, but I, I think the the small boy outside of Fort Sumner, and probably the fact that the Hispanos were planning to bust Billy out, because I can't help but think, obviously that they, they didn't need to do it in the end. Billy broke out himself, but if he hadn't done that, can you imagine being Pat Garrett and his deputies. <laughs> you got 
20 armed as Barno suddenly ride into Lincoln. They're going to bust the kid out. Who knows what could happen there? I mean, history could have been very, very different. Yeah. So. So um, uh, uh, you said that you had been, uh, you said that anyone who writes a book uh, about Billy the Kid can be attacked by, expect to be attacked by a pack of wolves. Have you been attacked by a pack of wolves? What what have they what have they picked on? You know how do you how do you feel your how do you feel you're doing in fighting off the wolves? Uh, mostly all right. Um, the book has been very strongly reviewed in my circles. I've had to deal with a couple of piss ants <laughs> that um, that well that falsely accused me of some things in regard to the book. Um, look, everyone has a different opinion. Um, that's that's fine. Uh, but for the most part, the reviews have been very positive, and it's been a seems to have been very well received. Not, I don't want to sound like I'm boasting. That's just what well, the reviews are. That's why we have you on the show. That's well short of boasting. We we <laughs> <really> judge <laughs> boasting, and that's you could go a lot farther. Believe me, oh, I yeah. have. Yeah. It, it's the greatest biography ever written. I've reinvented the term biography. There it is. Yes. Okay. Um, there you go. But uh, mo- mostly, but the wolves are more. Um, they're easy to deal with. They're, they're, they're mostly keyboard experts, social media experts on uh, <laughs> social media and stuff like that. That yeah. um, some of them, you know, you, you disagree with them about the slightest thing, and they act like you told them you just raped and murdered their family and burned the house down. It, it's yeah. it's just such an overreaction. But that's mostly easy to deal with. I think uh, there's probably some old timers out there maybe that don't like the book because it doesn't portray Billy the way they prefer to think of him. Way it goes, but ultimately, you know, you can't care too much about what I think. Right. So, go ahead, right. Chris. Finish this no, up here. No, no. Well, I was just going to say, you know, um, obviously, this book is its immediate appeal is going to be to people with an interest in the West and in the story of Billy the Kid, and that that, that that's a huge community. But but this book is now starting to reach. Well, people like Rick and I, who aren't necessarily Western historians, and it's going to go out to people who just like American history or history in general. Um, what would you say to people who aren't coming to your book or this story from an interest in the West? It's just, you know, they see it, they start to read it. What, why is Billy still important to us now? What's the, what's the thing about that story? Well... He lived an incredibly eventful life for someone who lived so fast and died so young. So much happened, uh, which is partly why the book is so long, even though he was about 21 when he was killed. Um, the appeal of Billy, his personality, partly. I mean, it, and I think the fact that I think Billy's greatest achievement was that he was able to steal horses and cattle and he shot some men and yet still remained very likable. <laughs> to the people who knew him and to a lot of people today. And I, I think that was probably his greatest achievement. I don't know how he pulled that off, but he did. Um, it's there's such a complexity about him, it, it, this young young man who was capable of unabashed banditry at times but was also capable of incredible kindness and consideration and he was extremely polite. Um, even some people knew him. That knew him said that uh, he didn't swear, he didn't cut like a lot of the other men did. Um, just little things like that that I think make him more intriguing, and it just paints a broader picture of who he was. Mm-hmm. Um, anyone who reads the book's not going to be bored. I mean, it's there's a lot of stuff that went on, and a friend of mine, uh, Bob Bowes Bell, who's the owner of True West Magazine, who's published a lot of my articles. Uh, he he once said that in terms of kind of, I think he was referring more into the public uh, perception kind of thing. He said that he feels you can kind of draw a, a direct thread from Billy Bonnie. I never call him Billy the Kid. To me, he's usually either just Billy or Bonnie. Um, but from Billy the Kid, uh, through James Dean, through Elvis Presley, and on to Kurt Cobain. And those were his words, not mine. Right in that he was the endless rebel that can't be tamed. And as Bell has also called him, the first good bad boy. And uh, they sell mugs, coffee mugs, which have, uh, and they're obviously designed for females. Billy has a lot of female fans. Right. And they have uh, three sections. They have single, taken, or mentally dating William H. Bonnie. <laughs> and there's a <laughs> next to that. And, and they sell those. Um, 
he's he's a popular young rebel. Um, but he was no saint either. He could be a, he could be a little a little shit when he wanted to be. So. <laughs> but I, I think that's what that's part of what appeals. I wrote about it in the conclusion chapter. I think that's partly his appeal. Is a lot of people they don't want the heroes to necessarily. Not that I would say he was a hero or a villain, but if someone that, that really likes him finds him interesting, I think the fact that he wasn't as pure as Driven as Snow kind of helps with that. It makes him more relatable, I guess. And he was a teenager at the end of the day for most yeah. of his exploits. Yeah. Well, I, I, I did, um, I saw online recently, I, I, I'll, I'll be a keyboard expert uh, for a moment, that uh, uh, one of the people who was a pallbearer for Billy lived long enough to to uh to witness the elvis presley phenomenon lived into the well, 1950s you didn't read that online you read that in my book oh that is in the book okay yeah that's that's in the photo section there's a photo yes of yes him, you're, uh, you're absolutely right i don't even know what i'm doing now it was in the photos so when i when i skimmed into the photo section but that is go an incredible and, go back to your keyboard ooh, that's yeah. an incredible <laughs> that's an incredible fact listen james b mills thank you so much thank for joining you, us today to talk about your new uh, hefty and very interesting and very well researched and well written book billy the kid el bendito simpatico uh thank you so much for spending time with us today on uh, history happy hour thanks james and, uh, just gracias. and if you just don't mind i'm gonna go get some sleep now because it's nearly two o'clock in the morning. all right go you, for you it that. okay Good night. cheers all right uh, Chris, I neglected to mention at the top of the show, we have uh, want to thank, of course, our Top Shelf patrons. Absolutely. Who are, and all of our Patreon patrons, but especially our Top Shelf patrons. Look, I rearranged the names yeah. here to make room for another column. I see. You're yeah. always thinking. You're yeah, always so thinking. We, can have, we can have at least 10 more names join us as Top Shelf patrons anytime they're ready to do so. Uh, and a reminder that you can find all of our archived programs and uh, on our website, historyhappyhour.com. You can listen on the History Happy Hour podcast. You could spend your whole life just as well you should absorbing history happy hour That's we're gonna be doing. into encore shows the next two weeks during the christmas season we'll be back with live shows uh in january all the details will be in our newsletter and of course on facebook and of course on the website uh but thank you very very much for joining us today keep living keep learning hey here's hoping that santa is good to you be safe everybody <laughs>